and we're podcasting. Welcome to the Godward Show. I'm your host, Casey. Uh, okay, we're moving on from Hawthorne, finally, and his insights into modern psychology. Let's return to tradition. Time for some Plutarch episodes. Right on. We're going to do the Greek lives. Um, But before I get into that, let me ask all of you, especially my loyal subscribers, to consider leaving a comment on this one. And, you know, do so consistently if you have any interest in what I'm doing or if you want to help preserve something of the Western literary tradition. I dislike shilling and begging, but I'm convinced now that the algorithm sort of feeds viewer activity. I've actually worked pretty hard at this this year, at this labor of love. And although fame and fortune isn't the goal, the goal really was to create something like an archive of great literature that isn't poisoned by woke left political propaganda. So I will continue making episodes and doing that stuff, but it'll feel more worthwhile to me if we can collectively hack the, you know, honestly pretty simple algorithm. I mean, even if you don't uh, listen, don't have time, don't care, whatever, it doesn't take much to leave a comment like, I like what you said about this book. So let's try a little teamwork, fellows. Okay, so like I said, let's do some Plutarch. Somewhere I read recently that someone famous said, (laughs) if all of world literature were thrown into the ocean, it would be Plutarch who sank last. So it's hard to overstate how well-known he has been, really, ever since he was alive. He was a kind of celebrity during his lifetime, to the extent that celebrity existed back then. Most interesting to me, he was a Platonist and studied under the famous teacher Ammonius, um, and he actually spent the last 30 years of his life as the priest at the Temple of Apollo, home of the famous Delphic Oracle, where his job was to interpret the oracles given by the Pythia. He was actually Greek by birth, but became a Roman citizen. Born in 46 AD, died in 119. So that means he lived under Caligula and Nero, and he saw the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem during his lifetime, and so on. Perfect time to be alive, you know? He was almost certainly initiated into the mysteries of Eleusis. I mean, what a life. This guy wrote in Greek but his writings were intended for both Greeks and Romans to read as Greek was widely read by Roman citizens in the first century. I have his um, parallel, sorry, I have his Greek lives here. That's the one I'm showing you, um, which is half of his best known work, which goes by the title Parallel Lives, where he pairs a famous Greek personage with a famous Roman personage sort of establishing the idea of moral truths that arise in eternal order, I think. So what I'm going to do for the episodes I do on Plutarch, I might just pick some of my favorite lives and do whole episodes on what is presented there. So in this episode, for instance, my focus will be on Lycurgus, the famous and semi-mythic lawgiver of Sparta. Before I get to Lycurgus, let me say I'm really going short on Plutarch's biography. And you should do yourself a favor and read more about him, starting on Wikipedia or whatever. One more thing I want to mention, he wrote lots of stuff, not just the lives. And among the most interesting of his writings to survive is a short dialogue, basically platonic in structure, called Why Pythia Does Not Give Oracles in Verse, where the main question is basically why did the oracles used to come in rhyme and rhythm, but no longer do in the first century. This fascinates me because it suggests that in the first century in Rome, there were questions about the history of lyrical speech and about whether a change in its form meant that it was no longer sacred, you know, or from the gods. It's all interesting, of course, because we have witnessed the same dissolution of rhyme and rhythm in the poetry of our own language and nation, beginning with the British Romantics when, you know, Walt Whitman took it up from them and turned it into what we call free verse, which is basically prose. Anyway, okay, so what does Plutarch say about Lycurgus and what makes Plutarch so famous? Lycurgus was alive around the time of the first Olympic Games, which gives him a date of 776 BC. 
that's really, really early. Like, basically, he was a contemporary of Homer and is equally sort of part legendary. I mean, equal to Homer in that sense. He is mentioned by Herodotus and Plato and Polybius, but all of them seem to be aware that Lycurgus's biography has been mythologized to some degree. Not quite to the degree that our King Arthur has been, but sort of similar in your imaginations. Many of you will have heard of Solon, the famous lawgiver of Athens. Well, Lycurgus was kind of the equivalent in Sparta. The first serious and successful legislator of a hugely significant people and his legal reforms are credited with shaping the character of the Spartan people, with an emphasis on three major virtues, equality among citizens, physical and military prowess, and frugality, or what we might call, you know, proto-Stoicism. Plutarch's biography of Lycurgus begins with an important description of the status quo on the eve of Lycurgus's life. He says, quote, lawlessness and disorder prevailed in Sparta for a long time, and it was as a result of this that Lycurgus's father came to lose his life while he was king. He was trying to prevent a brawl when he was fatally struck with a meat cleaver. So I'm picturing something like the cartels in Mexico, or maybe just the colorful part of Chicago, but really bad, right? Now the first legal act or reform that Plutarch, I guess the first, sorry, the first behavior, the first act that Plutarch records is when Lycurgus's brother, who was slated to become king, he was older, died and left a wife who was pregnant. The woman came to Lycurgus offering to kill the baby in her womb and marry him when he became king. Plutarch says, quote, Although he, Lycurgus, found her immorality abhorrent, he raised no objection to the actual proposal, but pretended to approve of it and welcome it. And then he goes into this kind of deceptive paragraph where, like, he lets her go all the way to term and deliver the baby, thinking that they would kill it when it arrived. But in fact, uh, he has some of his men steal the baby from her, seize it, and, you know, basically take it home with him and he announces to the people of Sparta, a king has been born to you. This is all very honorable, and I think it's intended to show the quality of his character. Well, I say honorable, I'm sure there are like feminists who would get mad for, you know, how he, whatever. You, you can listen to the story again if you want. Anyway, eventually, well, so first of all, the little boy who he saved from the abortion grows up to be, you know, the king. Uh, and, and so, like, so as to not cause problems, Lycurgus goes over, he leaves, because he doesn't want there to be a contested throne, so to speak. Um, but eventually, he's going to become king anyway, when the boy kind of comes up against revolutionary fervor and realizes really only Lycurgus can, you know, subdue and make peaceful again the Spartan people. Uh, but this whole period is an interesting one because while he's gone, before he's like welcomed back by his nephew, Lycurgus gets a chance to travel the world. He visits Crete and speaks with their legislators and teachers. And then he goes to Asia, where he first comes across the Homeric poems. Plutarch writes, quote, When Lycurgus noted that the poems contained, interspersed among the passages designed to prom promote pleasure and self-indulgence, a political and educational element which called for at least as much serious attention, he became very excited by them. And this, gentlemen and ladies, is how a man properly becomes a lover of literature. Anyway, then he visits Egypt and is impressed with their separation of the warrior caste from the other castes, and there's a rumor, though Plutarch doubts it after recording it, that Lycurgus made it all the way to India to study with the gymnosophists. When he finally returns to Sparta, as I said, the people are on the cusp of revolution. They basically demand that he take over. He kind of hems and haws, but then agrees on the condition that he be permitted to totally rewrite the legislation rather than having to do so through bureaucratic channels in a piecemeal way. The people agree. 
And he makes a trip to the Oracle of Delphi to consult the god and returns with the famous oracle in which the Pythia called him beloved of the gods and a god rather than a man. His first reform is, the, and so he's the legal reformer now, right? So his first reform is the one Plutarch says was most important, which is he establishes an institution of elders. Plutarch cites Plato here, who said that these elders were, quote, a source of security and restraint since they tempered the feverish rule of kings and had an equal voice in affairs of the moment. This council of elders met out in the wilderness among, you know, no halls of structures. The idea being, for Lycurgus, that statues and inscriptions would make the minds of people gathered there foolish and vacuous with inane thoughts, vanity, and so on. And even here you get a sense of the unique character of the Spartan people. The leaders, I mean, picture it, the leaders meeting out in the woods so as to ensure they do not become pompous and vain. I love it, obviously. The next major legal reform to be enacted was a redistribution of the land. Plutarch says there was terrible inequality, crowds of paupers without, poorly, or sorry, without property and without any means of support were accumulating in the city, and wealth was entirely concentrated in the hands of a few people. It took some explaining, but most everyone understood that this was necessary and eventually went along with this first reform. The next reform, however, was to try to redistribute the furniture. The rich people wouldn't have it. They got really pissed about this one. He saw, like Hergus saw, that he couldn't directly confiscate people's stuff, but this made him realize that their vanity in the form of monetary wealth was still a problem for the people as a whole. So he revoked all gold and silver coinage and made iron the only legal tender. The point of this was that it would, quote, not be valued anywhere else in Greece, and so no one could buy any foreign trash, no cargo was imported into their harbors, no verbal casuist set foot on Laconian territory, no vagabond diviner, no keeper of prostitutes, no maker of gold or silver ornaments, because there was no money to pay them with. Once luxury was deprived of the thing that enliven and the things that enliven and nourish it, it gradually wasted away of its own accord, and there was no advantage in owning a great deal of property because wealth had no means of displaying itself in public, but had to stay shut up in idleness at home. So the point is, Lycurgus tried to eradicate admiration of wealth altogether. And to accomplish this, he insisted on a third reform, which Plutarch calls his finest, and that was a system of common messes, you know, mess halls, dinners, basically. Everyone had to eat together, regardless of class or wealth. This was the reform that finally made the wealthy people of Sparta really pissed at Lycurgus. This custom, which, by the way, I mean, they couldn't do anything about it. He pushed it through, and this custom was observed strictly for a long time, almost 500 years. And anyone who tried to stay home and eat alone met with scorn from his neighbors, who teased him that he was too sensitive to eat the common slop, and so on. Plutarch writes, quote, Male children also used to go to these common messes to listen to political discussions and watch entertainments suitable for free men, and they themselves were taught to entertain others and tell jokes without descending into vulgarity and to be teased without getting annoyed. This is another thing that is generally held to be a particular feature of Laconian character, the ability to take a joke. Interestingly, one of Lycurgus' laws was that his laws should not be written down, but taught by way of conversation, so that they are implanted in the characters and training of the citizens. Uh, here come a few interesting reforms about women. First, he made the unmarried woman become tough by requiring a regime of 
physical exercise that involved running, wrestling, discus, and javelin. So that, as Plutarch writes, when the time came for embryos to take root in their wombs, they would gain a healthy start in healthy bodies and develop well, while the women themselves would have the strength to endure childbirth. Interesting. Also, Plutarch says the girls became accustomed to watching the naked young men parade around and dance together. The idea was that afterwards, after the performance, the, woman, the women would taunt the young men who did most poorly and honor those who deserved it. This used to fill the young men with ambition, we're told. I mean, I guess so. <laughs> Further, the women themselves used to go about mostly naked or even naked, but without a trace of lewdness, Plutarch says. Nudity accustomed them to simplicity and made them admire physical fitness. Isn't this interesting? Plato remarks that this dynamic encouraged people to marry for sexual rather than logical necessity, which meant more childbirth, which was good for the state. Isn't this? I mean, this is fascinating to me. A note about their marriage ceremony here. Excuse me. The women were forcibly abducted in the prime of their fertility. This is the marriage ceremony. And, quote, handed over to the so-called bridesmaid who would cut her hair very short, dress her in a man's clothes and shoes, and leave her lying alone on a straw mattress without any light to see by. Now listen to this. The groom, who was not drunk or otherwise rendered impotent, but was as sober as usual, first dined in his mess hall, and then slipped into the room, undid the woman's belt, picked her up, and carried her over to the bed. He spent only a short time with her before leaving quietly, and going to the same sleeping quarters as he had been sharing before with the other young men. This pattern continued into the future. He would spend the day with the men of his age group and take his rest with them as well, but he would visit his wife secretly, taking every precaution out of embarrassment and fear of being seen by anyone in the house. Meanwhile, his wife would be devising plans and helping to find opportunities for them to meet without anyone else knowing about it. They went on behaving like this for quite a long while. In fact, in some cases, there were children born before the men saw their own wives by the light of day. I mean, imagine that. Like, not even, just, you go right into the bedroom, don't even see her for up to nine months going at it, but otherwise just, you know, sleeping with the men and uh, doing guy things all day. And it gets weirder. Lycurgus added a statute that it ought to be acceptable to share the business of procreating children with others of sufficient excellence. Quoting Plutarch again, Suppose an older man with a young wife liked and approved of a young man of nobility and virtue. He could introduce him to her, and then, once the younger man had impregnated his wife with his noble seed, he could adopt the child as his own. Or again, suppose a man of high principles admired a woman who was married to someone else for her modesty and fine children. He could prevail upon her husband to let him sleep with her, so that he could sow his seed in rich and fertile soil, so to speak, and produce excellent children who would be blood relatives of others just as fine. And of course, as Plutarch says, this is all good for the state. It's good for the collective. And, Plutarch notes, it meant that promiscuity and adultery were virtually unknown in Sparta, to the point that in one famous instant, instance, a, a visitor asked a Spartan legislator, how they punish adulterers in Sparta. The legislator replies, we don't have any adulterers. And the visitor says, but suppose there were one. And the legislator says, his fine would be a bull large enough to bend over Mount Tagetus and drink from the Eurotas. And the visitor replied, how could there ever be a bull that big? 
So the legislator replied, how could there ever be an adulterer in Sparta? I mean, okay, this is fascinating, right? Like, first of all, as I said when I was reading, like, um, Herodotus, there's, there's something to be gained in reading Plutarch just for the way that it makes you kind of consider how arbitrary some of our institutions are. I know this sounds like deconstruction and relativism and all that, but, like, there's some value to knowing that not everyone does it your way, right? So certainly you find some of that in Plutarch. But what I wanted to say about it here is that, like, we speak often of logos, and what we mean by that, I'm talking about this channel and the people who watch it, is usually something like a truly existing natural order, which is most in keeping with the nature of humans and, you know, human nature or psychology. But considered as an epistemological question, like philosophically, I think it would be kind of difficult to justify our claim that this order, this Spartan order of marriage is somehow less orderly than the traditional Christian one. And here, I know, I sound, I just sound like a complete postmodern feminist or something, but if you, if you had to start from scratch and take these two systems, the one where basically it's like a cuck society and you, you know, arrange for your wife to get impregnated by another man and you impregnate other women who are married and it's like, well, I mean, like, other than just that's repulsive or, like, it doesn't seem like it would work, well, the fact is it did work for 500 years in Sparta and it seems to have been quite good. I mean, you think about it, it's like it's eugenic in the sense that it means more excellent genetics, you know what I mean? And, and like, I can see it being kind of good for the state in a way. I don't know. This is probably crazy talk, but I just thought you should hear about it. Anyway, this quick li the quick little uh, quip from the Spartan legislator there about how could there ever be an adulterer in Sparta, this is uh, one more feature of the Spartan character. They were given to few words and witty words. Plutarch says Lycurgus encouraged everyone to use simple, short sentences that conveyed a great deal of subtle meaning. I'll just give one more example here. Someone wanted to make the state a democracy, and Lycurgus himself replied, only after you've made your home a democracy. Now, it's hard to know whether this is part of the kind of mythic deep history associated with Lycurgus and early Sparta. Because, I mean, honestly, especially as like a person interested in language and literature and linguistics to some extent, I mean, it's difficult to imagine people simply being encouraged to become so many H.L. Mencken's or Mark Twain's, you know what I mean? It's like, it doesn't seem like people just work that way, but that's the story anyway. The Spartans ate little and trained very hard, so hard that Plutarch says they were the only people in the world for whom war was more restful than the preparations for war. Uh, that's because when they were out on the battlefield, they were allowed to relax their usual uh, regimen and just kind of do whatever they wanted until the fighting started. Like Hergus, banished all superstitious beliefs about funerals, which allowed people to make graveyards within city limits and locate tombs near sanctuaries, and this meant that even young children grew accustomed to the idea of death early on. The Spartans were incredibly harsh to the helots, who were basically a slave class, to the point that it was a rite of passage to kill a helot for some of the young men in Sparta. Lycurgus also did not let citizens leave Sparta. This to keep them from acquiring foreign habits and copying the ways of people who lacked culture and lived under different political systems. Plutarch says Thucydides was wrong to suggest the expelling of foreigners from Sparta was motivated by a fear that the foreigners would copy the Spartan system. Rather, according to Plutarch, Lycurgus, quote, was more afraid of the corrupting influence these foreigners might exert. Foreigners inevitably bring with them into a country foreign notions. Novel ideas lead to novel choices, 
and these in turn are bound to cause the development of a number of feelings and inclinations with, which clash with the euphony, as it were, of the existing political system. So that's pretty based, right? I mean, it's really interesting. I saw, what's that guy on Twitter, um, James something? He's like a, he's like a, you know, CPAC, you know, whatever, James something. And he was saying, uh, he, like, he was saying, almost nobody cares about demographics. What we care about are these ideologies like neo-Marxism and stuff. But if you listen to that quote I just read again, the, it seems that it is the changing demographics that bring the changes in ideology. So, I mean, this is an old thing, but there's Plutarch, you know, noted white supremacist, um, giving us a warning about that. Um, I think a lot of this is, you get the feeling with the Lycurgus essay, but maybe not with the rest of Plutarch. A lot of it seems kind of semi-mythic in the Lycurgus uh, chapter. It does seem that a lot of these reforms really worked well, in the sense that Sparta was a powerful force for 500 years or so. But you guys know me, I'm an anti-fascist libertarian. So I want to mention... Just one more excerpt from Plutarch, from the essay on Lycurgus, where he says, quote, In short, as a result of Lycurgus's reforms, his fellow citizens lost both the will and the ability to live as individuals. Instead, they became accustomed, be-like, to always being organic parts of the life of the community to swarm around their leader in a state of near ecstasy induced by their eager desire for recognition and to commit themselves wholly to their country. Literally just bug men, you know? Bees, he says, like bees. So, I mean, well, I mean, okay, look, I just want to once again call for, a, like, the middle way here, a little moderation. Like, yes, I recognize that we are currently being assaulted by the, you know, individualist revolution, the deracination program, and all shreds of collective identity are being hollowed out. But running to the opposite extreme seems to me still to be the fastest way to become like bees. And really, at that point, like, who cares if your race or people or your tradition survives if it is like as a hive of bug men hustling and bustling to, you know, brown nose their way to, like, recognition from the leader. All of this seems pretty pathetic in a way. And yet, it worked, didn't it? It worked for the, Sparta, the Spartans. So, as I said, these reforms stayed in place for 500 years. It was basically, un uh, sorry, it was basically under Lycurgus's model that the Spartans defeated Athens in the Peloponnesian War, and they stayed on track until, finally, Lycurgus, I think in the 4th century B.C., or sorry, Lysander in the 4th century BC, repealed the law about iron money and brought back gold and silver. As Plutarch said, flouting Lycurgus's laws so that the country became infected with love of wealth and with luxury, really for the first time in 500 years. And that's pretty much it as far as Sparta goes. I mean, you know, a century or two after that, they were, they had been just intermixed as Greek and then basically Roman and now they're gone, right? Okay. Wow. What a great episode. Thanks for listening. I'm almost finished reading the chapter on the Athenian lawgiver Solon, but it's not quite as good. And so I'm not sure that'll be my next episode, maybe something else. I've also been reading through Heidegger's letter on humanism. Uh, it's really difficult and slow. So give me some time, but I may eventually do an episode on that. Uh, you know, one of the, it's like, I keep coming back to this idea that I, I, I'm, I'm sitting here reading Heidegger, slowly, it's taking me hours to get through this, like, 40-page essay. And, I mean, and, like, the essay is apparently a response to Sartre's, what is it called, Being and Nothingness, which I did actually read about two-thirds of when I was in grad school. I mean, it's unbelievably dense and, you know, 
probably some bullshit. I don't even love Sartre, to be honest. There's sentences in there that just eat their own tail, and it's, you know, being is always the being of a being, and so on. And so Heidegger is writing a response to Sartre's essay that was called Existentialism is a Humanism. And the point is, like, I just get so tired of the way that if you accept like other people and of course this is i mean this is what you're doing accepting my summary of it i guess but like i don't want to accept anyone else's summary of heidegger people you know like and, and i love paul talk but paul talks always talking about vulgar heideggerianism and i'm like look i'm gonna read it and if i find any vulgarity in this heidegger i'll let you know but so far i don't and in fact the letter uh, uh, the letter on humanism seems to be against humanism and i find humanism to be rather vulgar so i don't know man i don't know exactly what's going on here with the heidegger thing but i'm still trying to understand it and then let's see i told you i would do episodes on emil choron that's still coming too i gotta really like i gotta find my zone when i'm gonna do the episode on choron because as much as i love his writing his ideas freak me out sometimes and i feel like you know, you got to take a deep, you got to almost like hold your breath through Choron because it's like, it's, um, all right, so there's that. And then I'm kind of vaguely looking for jobs again now. So I don't know, just maybe give me almost a week in between episodes here for a while, but we're still doing the secret streams every other Friday night. So not this Friday, I think, but next Friday, if you want to sign up for the Patreon thing, that's still, I think it's still really fun. I've been a little disappointed, by the way. I mean, I love how many of you have signed up to be my patrons. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It touches my heart. It keeps me going. Where are you for the secret streams? I want new voices. You guys are paying me $5 a month for this, for access to these secret streams. And then not showing up, or are you just watching the replay? Anyway, I don't know, but we've had some good conversations on there. All right, talk to you next time. Thanks for listening. This has been The Godward Podcast.